Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out. I'm Noah Silverman, and I work at Helios.ai. And today we're going to talk a bit about probabilistic programming, which is a daunting sounding title. Uh, and even worse, I have 20 minutes to give you all a good overview of this without getting into any math, without getting into any computer programming. So it'll be a bit of a challenge. But my hope for today is that you'll take away some different ways of looking at probability and different ways of looking at problem solving, which are very, very applicable in the, the health tech world. People, as we know, are random. The world is random. People's reactions to disease and medicine is random. So traditional models of how that's been done don't work very well, and things are changing very quickly. A lot of the new paradigms for doing this really, really help. So I want to give you a rough overview. So the concept is uncertainty. What we want to do, what we do at Helios, is we quantify uncertainty. We're always trying to figure out how do we measure and describe and account for uncertainty. And can we reduce the uncertainty to some respect? Simple example, if I ask for the average height, or the height of the next person who's going to walk in this room, we don't know anything. Well, we could start with the height of the average person in Hong Kong. Or wait, maybe it's somebody's child. Well, now we know a little bit more. We can reduce our uncertainty a little bit more. So a lot of this game, as I call it, is how do we learn and how do we reduce uncertainty? And then how do we describe and work with the uncertainty that we can't get rid of? Now, when you talk about randomness, most people think of this, completely randomness, and that's chaos. But really, randomness is not that. Randomness has a shape. If you flip a coin, you don't know what the answer will be. It's completely random, but I guarantee you it will be heads or tails. So when we talk about randomness, we talk about things like this, where yes, there's shape, you don't know the outcome, but you can understand the uncertainty. There are 16 face cards in a deck of cards. So 16 out of 52 is your chance of getting a face card. It's random, but you know something about it. So most people, again, when they think about probability, think of this. And we're skipping this. I want to start with a simple thought experiment. If we're talking about, I don't know, the number of glasses of water everyone had today, and we went around the room and counted, and we drew this nice little histogram. I'm sure you all remember this from your days at school. Um, you could have a bin for each count from seven to 13 glasses of water. And it's a rough representation. Now, if we went and polled everybody in Hong Kong, you might get a much wider distribution and the bins get smaller and smaller. And at some point, if you do that enough, you just get a curve. And that's the point of this exercise, is we start thinking about probability, we call it distribution. There are a bunch of curves like this that have standard names and standard shapes and they describe different kinds of random behavior. The nice thing about this is that you can usually summarize this curve with a couple of numbers. This is what's called a Gaussian distribution, otherwise known as a normal or a bell curve, and lots of you probably saw this in school. And what's nice is you can sum it up. It's an average of six, standard deviation of two. That means that all, for all your answers, 95% of them will fall between two and 10. The thing people miss is they'll look and say, oh, there's an average of six. But one out of 20 times, you're going to be outside that 95%. So if you're looking at something like drug treatments for a patient, you think, oh, 95% of the time, there are no side effects. Yeah, but 5%, one out of 20 people, you could be doing some real harm. So again, understanding the randomness and the distribution really helps you make better decisions. Now, we're going to do a bit of a jump, uh, and we're going to talk about linear regression. And this is going to motivate the eventual examples of how we get to medicine. If I just have four points in a row, I can draw a line. You could do this in Excel and say, OK, y equals x, or y equals 2 times x, and it's very, very simple. But the real world and people don't look like this. They look like this. Or worse, they look like this. And what happens here is you'll see we, we have an equation. Any software or Excel or whatever can fit that. But if you look at this graph, you're wrong most of the time. Most of those points are nowhere near that line. So if you're doing any kind of research or treatment or drug trials or blood tests or whatever, and you're looking at that average line, you're ignoring all the noise. Now, this is not a new concept. And people tend to describe things with error bands and confidence bands and things like that. But this motivates where we're going with probabilistic programming. This is just an illustration of the wrongness. And this is what we study. There's a shape to that. How wrong is this? Well, remember this guy? Instead of using this equation, y is this formula of x, what we can say is y is somewhere in that curve. We know the average is that equation, but there's a standard deviation. 
So now we've started to describe and quantify our, our uncertainty. Now we know something about the uncertainty of what we're measuring. And this is just the beginning baby step. Now, if you do this, what you're really looking at are, in a sense, parallel universes. This time you measured, you got this particular set of dots in this particular line. But maybe if you went and sampled another group of people, you would have gotten a slightly different set of dots and a slightly different line and so on. So if you think about all these gray lines, those are all different possible universes you could have seen depending on what you measured and who you measured. So how do we do this? How do we look at this? I'm sure you're all familiar with Microsoft Excel, right? Everyone in the room has used this, uh, probably too much. Um, so you normally would put a formula, C is three times A plus four times B or whatever it is. Well, with the new kind of software we have and with probabilistic computing, every one of these cells is represented by a curve, by a distribution. It doesn't have a fixed number. It has a probability of what number it could be. And every time you look in that cell, you'll get a different answer. And yes, it will fit this kind of curve if you went and looked in the cell enough but any single time you look, you don't know what the answer is. You just have prob the probability of the answer. So what that lets us do is do interesting formulas where we can take this probability shape and that probability shape, divide by another probability shape, and get some math out. And why you do this is to, again, quantify and capture the uncertainty. If you're not sure about things, or people respond differently, or ranges of things and treatments respond differently, why not model it as the curves and the shapes, and take your answer as a curve and a shape. It's not a fixed number, which is what people are comfortable with, but it's a more realistic way to capture what we're certain about and what we're uncertain about. Just a quick tangent on how we do this. Now, computers obviously can't think randomly. They work with numbers. But what you can do is you can sample numbers over and over and over and over again and look at the shape and the average. And a classic exercise, if you were in a PhD program doing this at school, you'd say, well, let's look at pi. Pi, you know, which describes the shape of a circle. Well, pi, if you from, we'll skip the geometry, it's just the area of the circle divided by the area of the square. So if I went and took 1,000 grains of rice and threw them on that square and counted how many grains of rice were in the circle, how many grains of rice were in the square, and divided, I could go pi. And computers do this internally millions and millions of times over per second of just randomly sampling things, plugging them into the right formula, and telling you what the shape of the curve is. So a lot of this comes down to random sampling amongst the uncertainty. Now, when you do this in software, this is from a program called Stan. It's a personal favorite. For each item, there's four numbers in this formula. After you've sampled a few million times, you'll see they have shape on the right. And they're not all smooth curves, and they're not clearly or neatly defined. But it lets you understand, you know, maybe this is your answer. And you can see, well, most of the time my answer is around three, but sometimes it gets up to five. So we might want to account for that, especially, again, when you're dealing with people. So a quick summary or a quick demonstration of how this works. There's a classic data set used in school a lot, looking at infant mortality across a bunch of hospitals in a region in the U.S. There were 2,814 surgeries, 208 people died from the surgery. So around 7.5%. But you can do better. There's 12 hospitals. So the first thing people did is they said, well, for each of the 12 hospitals, how many deaths were there and how many surgeries were there? OK, well, what does that do? We can get percentages. Wow, hospital 1 is a really little percent. Maybe they're doing something right. Maybe we should study them. Hospital 8 is a really high percent. Maybe they're doing something wrong. The problem is, each hospital has a different number of surgeries. Hospital one only had very, very few surgeries, so you probably didn't get a good estimate. If you only operate on two people and nobody dies, is it safe to say there was zero percent death rate? Probably not. If you operate on 10,000 people and nobody dies, well, you can probably say that with much higher confidence. So what we do is we use this probabilistic modeling software and as promised, I will spare all of you the actual computer code and math. But we describe the hospitals. We say each hospital has a different death rate. And this is the curve we're using. The average is around 7%. Some hospitals might be higher. Some hospitals might be lower. But we're fitting this model, assuming death rates follow a curve. And what you get out, the software uses theta as the name of the death rate. 
you can see for each hospital, based on the data we have, there's a curve, and there's a little black line in there, which is the average death rate for each hospital. The width represents how confident you are. So notice, hospital three, it's a very small curve because it had the most surgery, so you're very, very confident about what its death rate is. Hospital one didn't have that many. So yeah, its death rate was low, but if you look all the way to the right, the model's telling you that there's a good probability that it's higher than what you've seen so far. So this kind of probabilistic modeling gives you a much more realistic view uh, of how these random and noisy systems work. Now, where this is interesting again, in medicine, this is a classic flow chart. And this is something a lot of doctors, are there any doctors in the room? Okay, so I'm sure somewhere in the boards of the medical studies you've seen, there's a lot of classic treatment algorithms and treatment flow charts based on disease and diagnosis. And a lot of things started to look, you know, look like this in the older literature. What's happening, is they're starting to look like this. This is an example for uh, heart disease, and they're looking at all sorts of things that impact. And this particular research group looked at the curves and the probability and relationships across every input. Every one of these ovals represents multiple curves. And they're able to run this forward and backward. So if somebody has these symptoms and this heart disease and this family history, what's the probability their diet is bad? If their diet was good and they had this symptom, what's the probability they have a family history? And so using the probabilistic programming lets you have a much broader view of how all these things interrelate and a much broader view of treatment. Hopefully that gives you some things to think about and uh, possibly some ideas you can use in some of your own projects. Uh, I'll be around if anybody has questions. Thank you.